Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I think we're at four o'clock, so good to go. So, uh, welcome everyone to the meeting, uh, Climate Emergency Sustainability Panel. Uh, I think we've got everyone here we're expecting today, so that's great and welcome. Uh, uh, as usual, the meeting is being webcast, so uh, just so that you're aware that someone somewhere is videoing you and that's going out on, on YouTube. I think as we speak, uh, uh, to try and keep the, the meeting uh, manageable, I'll try and uh, uh, pick up the kind of normal form of doing two questions from each of the members, and then if we've got time, we'll try and play a little bit more discussion. I think particularly with item uh, eight, renewables, that the idea is that's more of a policy development discussion, so we may be a little bit more flexible around that, but I know that some members have got meetings at half six, so I'm hoping that we'll finish by six, hopefully is my target. We'll see how that goes. Uh, okay, so if I move us on to apologies for absence. Okay, I'll just quickly do the emergency evacuation procedure. Um, when the continuous alarm bell sounds, you must evacuate the building by one of the designated exits and proceed to the named assembly point. The designated exits are signposted, arrangements are in place for the safe evacuation of disabled people. And apologies um, from Councillor Karen Walker and from Councillor Ryan Wills. And no substitutes, is that right? Yeah, perfect. Joe, yeah? Joe, can you report to the committee? Thank you, Councillor. Great. Uh, if we move on to declarations of interest, are there any declarations of interest that count, uh, members haven't declared previously that they think are pertinent to today? I'm not seeing anyone indicating. Okay, if it, if it occurs to you as we're going through, then feel free to pipe up and declare it uh, when we're in, 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 in the detail. Okay, in terms of item five, urgent business agreed by the chair. I don't think there is any urgent business, so we'll move on. Okay, so uh, we're down to item six, uh, public statements. So we've got two public statements. I think our first uh, public statement is from Tim Newark. So uh, Tim, are you, yeah, perfect. If I hand over to you, I think you, the normal uh, format is to do three minutes. Sure. And then we'll do any factual questions from, from the panel. Uh, so over to you, Tim. Shall I stand up or just? Whatever Whatever. you're comfortable. Um, I'm, a, I'm a resident of Central Bath, living in Barton Buildings, and we live in the middle of a seagull breeding colony. Uh, recent figures say that 81% of the nearly 2,000 gulls living, living in Bath are based in the central wards. Ever since my family moved to Bath 40 years ago, the noise and faecal mess from these invasive birds has got worse and worse. This summer was perhaps the worst period. As the temperatures rose to record highs, we could not open our bedroom windows on a hot night because of the ear-splitting racket of gulls in the morning from 4.30 a.m. onwards. I, it, it has been measured at 73 decibels. This is the racket the girls make. Louder than a bedroom a, a, a alarm clock that registers at 70 Decibels. Surely that has to be an infringement of our rights to a good night's sleep and fresh air. As Baines intends to encourage more residents to live in their properties in the Milson Street quarter, they must take responsibility for drastically reducing the gull breeding population in this area. You can't ask people to buy or rent properties without first dealing with this avian noise and mess. It would not be responsible and is an environmental concern as vital as any other. The means to do this has been accepted by your gull officer, Gordon Dugan, and includes the netting of central roof guttering where they nest and the applications of spikes to chimney stacks and high points where they oversee their nests. All this, all this requires is a budget to begin the work. It would be a cost effective in investment that would, in, would enable Baines to attract more residents to live in the centre of this beautiful setting. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, we've got uh, that as an agenda item, so, so that's very timely to, to bring that statement. Does anyone in the panel have any factual questions they want to ask Tim? I'm not seeing anyone indicating. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you're welcome to stay and observe, and, and uh, uh, information will be on, on the, on the uh, council website around the presentations and whatnot. Okay, so if I move on to then Robin Kerr, I believe you're with us. Thank you, Chair. Um, I speak for the Bath Alliance for Transport and Public Realm, as our current seagull situation is a public realm problem for this World Heritage City. I support the Council's efforts to lessen the bird's impact. Aled Williams, from whom we shall hear shortly, has been doing his very best to serve the people of Bath but under the current draconian restrictions, there is a limit to what he can do. Gull numbers will continue to rise unless there is a change of policy nationally. Bath, in common with an increasing number of inland towns, suffers from an infestation of seagulls in the breeding season. These cause damage to the Georgian buildings and affect the health of our citizens due to their prolific feces, often infected, and disturbance to citizens asleep in the early mornings, as Tim has been so eloquently pointing out. Many people believe they come here for food, scattered on the pavements, but in reality, they began nesting in towns long before they began feeding in them. Georgian rooftops provide perfect nesting sites, sheltered and immune from predators. The adult, uh, the adult birds can range 50 miles to find food, though if we leave rations for them in our public realm, they will certainly take advantage of this. Their numbers are still increasing. Natural England does not accept this. Despite ample scientific evidence, much of it collated by the noted biologist and scientific author Linda Gamlin, who lives near St. James's Square, and we're very lucky to have her. Until 2019, the general license allowed eggs of herring gulls and lesser blackback gulls to be removed or treated by local authorities at their discretion. The current organizational license, as granted to Baines, drastically curtails the number of eggs that can be prevented from hatching. It also requires councils to justify each action on a specific health risk basis. The Gull team at Natural England, despite having no medical expertise, decides what constitutes a health risk and has set the bar very high. Across the country, urban Gull numbers are rocketing as a result. So impractical and ineffective is this procedure that the council in Gloucester, one of the places most affected, has refused to have anything more to do with it. Accordingly, Linda Gamlin has been campaigning specifically for roof nesting gulls of the two pest species to be put back on the general license. This is a simple decision that DEFRA could make, putting an end to all natural England's red tape. On the bright side, I can report that our MP, Vera Hobhouse, has been campaigning to have DEFRA acknowledge that these gulls are not an endangered species, and not endangered species, and to have them better controlled. She has joined with her fellow MPs in a host of other historic places similarly affected, including Gloucester, Worcester, Devizes, York, Cheltenham, Canterbury, and others, to lobby the DEFRA Secretary of State. Some progress is now being made. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'll go round the panel. Is there any factual questions that anyone wants to raise? No, thank you also for your, for your statement. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick up on the goal agenda when we get there in due course. Okay, if I move us on to item seven, we've got the minutes of the last meeting. May I confirm that these are a correct record? Uh, Shelley and Grant. Great, thanks very much. Do we normally vote on that? We'll do, yeah, that's okay. Perfect. So I'll then move us forward on to, I'm going to bring up the agenda, item 11, cabinet member update. So we're going to jump that because of time factors. So uh, Sarah, I think you're doing us a verbal update. So I'm Sarah Warren, Cabinet Lead for Climate Emergency and Sustainable Transport, and I'll give you a quick update on some things that are happening across the um, range of areas I'm interested in. Um, so we'll hear a little more in, in, under the renewables item, but um, there's been some really good progress on the local plan partial update, which um, uh, is um, rolling through the phases and nearing um, 
nearing completion and will make us, um, assuming it goes through in its current form, will make us a leading local authority on planning policy for climate when it's approved and will make um, bringing in renewables installations much more... Much more straightforward. Um, another update is that we've just run our second Climate and Biodiversity Fence Festival last month in collaboration with the community, which I think was well attended. And um, uh, I certainly enjoyed um, some events in um, the Abbey Square with my son on Saturday morning. Um, and I think lots of other people did. Um, then, our Liverpool Neighbourhoods um, project, uh, which aims to uh, make some residential areas, uh, pleasanter places to spend time on foot uh, and, and on bikes um, and to just to spend time in generally is progressing. We have been working through um, uh, consultation and then um, the, uh, and co-designed by the community and the co-design has been presented back in the form of exhibitions um, and um, we are now progressing on to the um, final design stage with those and there are some pilots that will um, come forward uh, in, in, in well shortly in the coming weeks um, active travel schemes um, so uh, the um, we bid for funding under the active travel scheme and were successful and our upper Bristol Road and Beckford Road cycle routes are currently um, in the final stages of construction uh, on electric vehicles um, You'll be happy to know that we have uh, uh, quite a number of rapid chargers now live in our car parks around Bath and North East Somerset, uh, and a new officer in post, actually, who's a specialist in that area. Um, now, that on buses, there's a bit of bad news, um, which is that as of um, today, I think, um, new bus timetables have been brought in. Um, this is really, uh, I think, as Bath and North East Somerset, we've been quite badly let down uh, by FIRST and by the West of England Combined Authority, and there have some, been some rather savage cuts to our bus service, and we continue to campaign very hard to um, try to see some of those reversed. Um, and then on e-scooters, there have been some developments. Um, uh, mainly that last Thursday we saw a geographical expansion that permitted the uh, use of e-scooters to travel up to the university. And I think that concludes my updates. Happy to take um, questions. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I, th I think it's really helpful to get that quick overview, so I, th I think the panel appreciate that. So uh, if I do uh, one question from each panel member, start off with uh, Lisa, you caught my eye. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sarah, you mentioned the uh, livable neighbourhoods and a few were coming on stream. Could you identify how many will be coming on stream shortly, please? Um, so we have, um, I think, three pilots can be expected very shortly and hopefully elements of others, but we're just working through the, the programme and how that, will, um, uh, how that will play out, the detail of... So it's about putting, you know, programme management, about making sure we've got the right um, project capacity to, in place to do the right things. Thank you. Uh, Shelley? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, just thinking about the, 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 the scheme, the voice scheme extending to the university. Um, so are the university promoting it to students in a sort of a... Because I know they had some trials a couple of years ago, I remember, sort of people could try them out up there, students. But, I mean, are they actually promoting, you know, the fact that it's an alternative to, to the bus, etc., when the buses do get full, as they do sometimes? And and um, they'd be a useful alternative. I believe there has been some promotion of... Um, <laughs> certainly of safety elements as part of the um, Freshers' Week. I'm not sure of um, further detail, but we can find out the answer and get back to you. Thank you. Any other... I'll let people have a second go if you've got a burning second question. No? OK. Thank you very much. If we move on to then the next item, which is the renewable item, and I think we've got a presentation around that, so if people want to adjust where they're sitting so they've got a better view of the screen, feel free to do so. Uh, and I think we've got... Is, is, are you introducing the item, Sarah, or is Rob...? Uh, yeah, OK, yeah. so I'll let you... Yeah, and I'll also uh, introduce Councillor Alastair Singleton, who's sitting next to me and who is the Renewables Advocate and has been assisting me across a range of climate emergencies, so has come for the discussion. 
So in March 2019, as you know, the Council declared a climate emergency, resolving to provide the leadership enabling the Bath and North East Somerset area to be carbon neutral by 2030. The climate action plan that followed that declaration included a commitment to improve the planning policy framework to enable 300 megawatts of electricity generation by predominantly external providers from renewables by 2030 in the Bath and North East Somerset area. Our current local plan includes a target of 110 megawatts by 2030, um, and we need to update our planning policy. Um, so the local plan partial update examination that is close to completion includes a new renewable energy approach that is guided by a landscape sensitivity assessment and aims to holistically integrate various factors into the determination of renewable energy generation proposals, including a minimum biodiversity net gain requirement of 10%. Um, support for continued agricultural use and the consideration of community benefits and whether the scheme is run by a community energy provider. The next local plan, um, which we're just um, beginning the process of, will include new targets that take into account the 300 megawatt identified for net zero by 2030. As an administration, we're also committed to leading by example by achieving net zero by 2030 in our operations. To that end, there is a strong focus on installing renewable energy on the Council's estate. In the last year, we've installed a 67 kilowatt solar PV array at Charlton House Care Home in Canesham and 84 kilowatts at Bath Keys South. Over 200 kilowatts of solar PV is in the near pipeline for two further council operated care homes, whilst further solar installations are in pro progress at the state of the art Canesham Recycling Hub at Pixash Lane and at Grosvenor House as part of the refurbishment of building for supported housing service with a pipeline of further sites in development. And Jane and Robin will tell us a bit more about these. Um, domestic and business solar PV installed capacity has doubled across Bath and North East Somerset since we declared a climate emergency in 2019, and the rate of growth has significantly accelerated through 2021 and 2022, which is partly as a result of the Solar Together scheme that Bath and North East Somerset has been a part of. Um, additional funding for the decarbonisation of heating at council-owned buildings is being sought through, through the public sector decarbonisation scheme fund when bidding opens later this month. And now I'll hand over to Jane and Rob, who will tell you a bit more about our pipeline of projects. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just going to um, talk to you for, for a couple of slides. Um, so just to explain what the presentation will cover. So we're going to have a little bit of context um, around targets and policy issues. We're going to tell you a bit more about the current funding opportunities, about that corporate work program that Sarah has um, mentioned and the, and the pipeline of projects in a lot more detail. Um, we'll then look into the, the district-wide challenge, that 300 megawatts challenge. Um, the, we'll, we'll do a piece on the role of community energy and then we'll finish off with talking about the next steps that we're planning in tackling that challenge and finish off um, back with Sarah and, and the chair um, on a, a Q&A and, and that discussion. So um, moving on to the targets and, and policy context. Um, Sarah's touched on this, but I, I think it's really important to understand this context, which is that the 300 megawatt target is an indicative target based on modelling uh, and sits alongside all the other things that we need to do to decarbonise the economy in Bath North East Somerset. So the 300 megawatts doesn't achieve net zero on its own. It's the, it's the renewable energy contribution to it. We also have to decarbonise, making buildings more energy efficient, making sure that new build is all net zero, um, and obviously all of the transport work um, that contributes to reducing carbon emissions are all part of the overall plan. Um, so that's just to give, give that, that context. And the 300 megawatt target is not a council target, it's not a target for us to deliver by ourselves, um, but we have an absolutely vital role um, in providing the leadership and the facilitating action like the planning framework to enable that to happen. So that's really important to understand, I think. Um, and as Sarah referred to, the local plan currently, the target in there is different. It's 110 megawatts because the local plan is several years was, was set several years ago and was based on an evidence base that existed then. A new ev evidence base, we're working really closely with the planning policy team now on the new local, pla local plan, which will be due for adoption in 2020. And that will, um, we will make absolutely certain that the new target that's set within the local plan will be in line with our net zero um, aspirations. Um, and um, uh, yeah. So I, won't, I don't need to go into that, I don't think, anymore. And I think in terms of national context, it's always important to point out to people that the national policy here is 
is around a net zero target for 2050, not 2030. Many local authorities up and down the land have declared climate emergency and net zero by 2030, but the policy framework that's set nationally is for 2050. So that does create some tensions and difficulties when we're trying to go beyond sometimes um, what is in, for example, the national planning policy framework. We're trying really hard. The evidence work that we do has meant that we've, gone, we've been able to push a bit further in those local plan, that the recent updates to the local plan through the local plan policy update. So we're working uh, with other local authorities to see how far we can push the envelope within that 2050 um, constraint. Um, so it, but it's important to understand that. Um, and then I think another thing that comes up frequently around the delivery of renewable energy is the issue around um, connecting new renewables that are produced locally to the national grid. It's a really significant constraint. It really does get in the way. Um, currently, um, Western Power Distribution, which is now called National Grid, so they're all, they're all now part of the National Grid, all the local um, uh, distribution companies. Um, they are currently unable to connect any new renewables in Bath North East Somerset that's over um, a megawatt um, onto that grid until after 2028, which does, as I say, because their, their targets are all aligned to 2050, does somewhat get in the way of our 2030 target. However, um, I want to just reassure you that we are working really, really hard in terms of that we have regular conversations now with um, WPD and have apprised them of all of our our local targets, our local data, because that then helps them in the conversations that they're having around funding and around changing some of the, the rules that they operate within nationally. Um, and we're working through the West of England um, combined authority who are working on, on behalf of all of the local authorities in the West of England, because this is a this is a regional issue and a national one. This issue around grid constraint um, is, is across the whole country because the grid was designed for huge centralised power stations like Drax, like Hinkley. It wasn't designed for dispersed renewable energy. And we're in the middle of that energy transition from big centralised to decentralised. And we're just getting caught in the middle of that. I think that but we're doing everything we can to try and influence those changes that need to come nationally. So I think those, those constraints and those contexting pieces are really important to understand. But now I'll, I'll pass over to Rob for the much more exciting stuff about what they're doing. Thanks. Okay, so the <clears throat> two main funds really for uh, Baines relating to um, renewable energy at the moment. Um, the first one there is our own capital uh, pot, which we're partway through spending. Um, and the, any project which comes through that has to, um, has to wash its face essentially, which um, is becoming easier due to the differential in the energy price currently. Um, the other main pot we've got at the moment is the public sector decarbonisation fund. Uh, that's actually just been announced that we need to submit um, to that this week on Wednesday. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about those uh, projects which are, um, are going into that um, bid submission. And we'll focus firstly on the corporate work program. So that uh, relates to our corporate estate, so the council's own estate. And, and uh, earlier studies suggested that our um, operational demand requires an installed capacity of 12 megawatts. So we'll talk about the estate in that context. So this chart is, uh, represents, um, the full chart represents 12 megawatts of our operational demand. So you can see uh, at the top, the black um, segments are what is installed already and what is operational already. And that's the Civic Centre, Charlton House Care Home, uh, Lewis House, uh, Newbridge Primary School. Uh, the green to the left of it is that which is in the pipeline on our corporate estate, so that which is being built or is about to be built, um, including Pixash Lane. Um, two care homes, two further care homes have uh, solar panels uh, going on them as we speak, uh, Coombe Lee and Cleve Court. Um, Odd Down Sports Ground is expecting some solar panels as part of its redevelopment. Uh, and Canesham Sports Centre, uh, Clutton Depot, um, those solar panels have been ordered. And we're planning for St. Cana School, one of the four maintained schools as part of the uh, corporate estate. So you can see the large segment um, taking up sort of two thirds of, of that pie is uh, the potential pipeline, so those sites which uh, are being sort of scoped at the, at the moment. 
Um, one of the main ones there, you've got uh, solar canopies, and uh, that's something which the park and ride car parks lend themselves to. Um, so we're just revisiting uh, the feasibility of those um, as the unit prices uh, have come down when it was first explored earlier on. Um, but obviously, as Jane mentioned, we do have connection issues, and uh, obviously we need to connect to um, National Grid substations, so there's a substantial cost involved there. Uh, but we are exploring those uh, in collaboration with, with transport and the mobility as a service aspirations and the EV charging aspirations. So um, we're commissioning a piece of work on that as we speak. Uh, an earlier study suggested there was also opportunity across the council of the state for some ground-mounted solar. Those sites haven't been specifically identified yet, um, but they would represent a big chunk of that 12 megawatts of operational uh, installed capacity. I mentioned there the leased care homes. Now, um, three care homes are, are, are part of the council estate and uh, operated by the council, but also there were two um, eight, run by HCRG and Curo. We're in conversations with those. And similarly with the sports centres, uh, Bath Sports Centre operated by GLL uh, on a profit share basis with the council uh, and slightly differently, Midsummer Norton Sports Centre. And there's also the Connections Day Centre in Lidlington, which we're exploring options for, which is part of the corporate estate and uh, Newbridge Primary, which is one of the uh, maintained schools. So that's the corporate estate. Um, and just to go over some of those, uh, so Charlton House is what's already um, has solar panels on it and an air source heat pump um, and energy, other energy saving measures such as uh, LED lighting. And following on in the same um, uh, in the same sort of example of that, we've got the other two care homes there, Coombe Lee and Cleve Court. We've already got um, about 100 uh, kilowatts going, uh, of solar panels going on each of those. And uh, on Wednesday, we'll be submitting a bid for air source heat pumps um, in addition to the LED lighting, which is already also going in there. Um, and Clutton Depot is in progress, as well as um, Pixash Lane, which we think might be the largest uh, roof-mounted installation uh, in Bath and North East Somerset when it's complete. And just an example from the pipeline, as I said, Odd Down Sports Ground, we expect to have about 100 kilowatts uh, of um, installed capacity on there, about 55 kilowatt on St Cana School in Cainshan, and perhaps up to 350 uh, kilowatts on the leisure centres. So the next steps, as I said, were, would be to continue to explore the, the solar canopies over the car parks. Um, also, as I mentioned, uh, the, the leased care homes. The solar canopies could uh, provide a, a significant uh, chunk of that 12 megawatt operational demand up to 3.8 megawatts um, it has been identified. Um, yeah, and we continue to work with partners about the um, long-term leased leisure facilities, given the, the, the importance of, of operating costs for leisure facilities currently. Uh, and there are further opportunities with the maintained schools. So there are four schools which are in the um, uh, council's estate. Uh, the, the rest have been academised, and uh, there's already a well-established partnership with the community energy provider at a lot of those schools with substantial capacity uh, being rolled out across a, a lot of the roofs, uh, school roofs across Bath and North East Somerset. And uh, in its uh, development stage, really, the carbon, carbon offset fund, um, yeah, it's being, it's being developed. It's not a thing that exists quite yet, um, but that seeks to address um, uh, helping uh, so lower, lower cost uh, residents um, get access to the benefits of um, uh, solar PV. So the district-wide challenge um, beyond the council's estate, so this includes private solar and commercial installations, community energy installations. Um, that indicative 300 megawatts that Jane mentioned for 2030, I'll talk about what's in the pipeline and the scale of the gap and how that gap might be closed. 
and the role of community energy. Jane will talk about and the next steps in tackling the challenge. So this pie um, represents that 300 megawatts. And you'll see again in black, uh, to the left is the installed capacity. Um, we've got Chelwood, one of the smaller segments of that, the Chelwood Community Energy um, Solar Array, and Wilmington Farm, a similar size next door to that. Um, we've also got, uh, in a slightly smaller segment there, the Bath Key South, uh, the council offices, there's a water wheel at uh, Bathampton and some of the academ academised and uh, council schools. The green segment I've just updated today because we have heard that um, Howgrove Farm in Nemnet Thrubwell has just uh, got planning permission and that's a significant nine megawatt um, solar PV installation in addition to the Marksbury Plain that also got um, planning permission earlier this year. So our pipeline is looking healthier than, than it did uh, a few months ago uh, across the whole district and totaling uh, 26 and a half megawatts. And there's also potential pipeline that we can talk about uh, and that we know of um, and that we expect to happen and a significant part of that 216 megawatts, so a significant part of that red sector we expect to be eaten into but we haven't had planning applications or confirmation of exactly what that will be. Um, uh, and we expect, you'll see uh, on, the, on the left there, that, that largest chunk of the black installed solar being private solar. So that is domestic and uh, business and agricultural buildings, solar uh, installations. And it's a conservative estimate of 40 megawatts. Um, we've seen that grow significantly over the last few years. And as Sarah mentioned, it, it's uh, more than doubled, or it's about doubled since early 2019. Uh, and yeah, the, the, we, the range is up to uh, 70 megawatts, but there's some uncertainty over the central data about that. Um, so, so that's still a low proportion of the uh, domestic and private roofs. So we expect quite a significant uh, expansion of installed capacity uh, beyond the council's uh, domain really um, to make a part of that and we expect also to see some more ground mounted um, solar uh, installations happening commercially and with community energy to also um, uh, eat into that uh, red sector there. We're just beginning work on, on uh, developing uh, or picking up uh, the energy strategy um, to also understand how we can enable uh, getting to the 300 megawatts by 2030. Um, over to okay. you, Jane. Thanks, thanks, Rob. Um, so um, we thought it would be helpful just to, to remind um, the panel about um, the work of Community Energy in Bath North East Somerset. Bath, community, Bath and North East Somerset is one of the places where community energy was pioneered um, about 10 years ago. We have one of the country's leading community energy organisations, um, Bath and West Community Energy, who were, played a significant role in helping community energy develop across the rest of the country. So it's something that we are very proud of. We have cooperation agreements with Bath and West Community Energy since 2010 um, and with Cainsham Community Energy more recently since 2010. 18. And as I say, the, the people that, that are involved in running Bath and West Community Energy, the MD there, is on the government's panel advising central government on the role of community energy in delivering this new dispersed renewable energy system um, and how it works and why community energy is important in that because it engages with the community and the community is then involved in and owns the, the renewable energy in their area and gets the, all of the, 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 the economic benefit is all retained within the local economy. Um, but it's, it's absolutely vital in getting the community to understand and to want and to want to engage with renewable energy in their local local district. So that's that's the reason why we've supported community energy from from the get go, um, because we can see that it's the way in which you help to unlock the potential for renewable energy across our, our district in ways that the community want and understand and are happy with. Um, the, what Rob didn't say to you is that in the, the um, percentage of that renewable energy that we're seeing developing over Bath North East Somerset, um, this calculation might need to be slightly revised because we've just had that new 
new, new lump come in, but um, at the, with the previous numbers, 40% of the installed renewable energy capacity in Barton, North East Somerset was community owned, owned by community shareholders with those, those benefits going back and with the profits going back into their communities and paying for other projects that help to decarbonise local, local community halls or to set up an Age UK club to help elderly folk to, to manage their energy um, consumption and make their homes more efficient, that sort of thing. So, so huge benefits for that, but also it really is starting to deliver at scale, um, which is something that people doubted. But I think, you know, community energy is different in that it's all, the assets are, are locked into the community. They can't be overtaken by anybody else, and all the, all the revenue goes back into the community. But they are otherwise commercially successful um, organisations. So I just wanted to explain all of that. Um, I think that number about the amount of money that Bath and West Community Energy have put back into the community for those community um, energy projects actually stands, in, that we've just had a new figure that's come in for the last year, I think it's gone up to about £300,000 that's been reinvested back um, into the community. So I, th I thought it was just important for the, for the further discussion to, to, to give you a bit, more, a bit of background on what community energy is and why we've been working so closely with them. Um, and as, as Rob pointed out, um, those, those schools that are no longer within our estate, um, they're now, th there's, there's, there's a lot of work going on with Bath and West Community Energy helping those schools to get solar up onto their roofs and reducing their running costs as a result. Um, so then, in terms of the next steps that we're planning, the, the, the team, um, so Rob's talked about that corporate pipeline, um, where we're working across all services to identify more projects, and we're finding that, that more is coming through um, all the time. So we are, we're, we're feeling pretty confident that we can deliver net zero in the council's operations through the delivery of renewable energy projects across our estate um, by, by 2030. Um, we've got, as, uh, this is a bit of a summary really, so we've got those local plan policies that need to be, um, need to, need to be more ambitious to align with, with 2030 and we're working really closely with our planning policy colleagues on the development of an evidence base to enable that more ambitious um, target um, in, the, in the next plan. As I mentioned, we're doing work locally and regionally on how to unlock that grid issue. One of the things Rob didn't mention, but which um, is, is potentially there, is finding ways around the grid connection by building battery storage um, or EV charging, which basically gives you battery storage in the cars, into projects so that actually more of the energy can be used directly locally rather than having to go onto the grid at all. That's one of the ways around we're looking and exploring with people like Bath and West Community Energy and other experts, what other mechanisms might there be locally that we could instigate or enable that could get round this grid connection um, problem. Um, we're, we, we're, we, we had some work done last year and we're, we're starting to pick that up again now that we've got staff looking at how can we work more with both the commercial and community energy sectors to accelerate that district-wide district um, installation and, and crack that 216 megawatt gap that's currently there, although we do know that there's a lot, a lot of potential projects in the pipeline that just we can't record yet because they haven't gone through any kind of official, they're not, they're not on, the, on the official kind of list as it were. Um, and we are obviously putting a lot of effort into maximising funding opportunities in the area um, and we'll be putting a bid into the public sector decarb fund um, on Wednesday as, as um, as Rob mentioned. So um, we can skip over the next slide. These are all the um, materials that, that we refer, have been referring to that you had a chance to look at before the, the session. And then um, over to Sarah for the final. Yeah, so um, this is where we really want your input and to hear your ideas um, about how we can move further and faster um, because this is policy development today. So um, how can we encourage more renewables uh, across the district and, and how important it is, do you think it is to develop the partnership with our community energy providers? Great. Uh, thank you, Jane, Rob and Sarah and the team for, for that. Uh, YK, you've caught my eye first. Uh, away you go. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> we all recognize uh, the challenges because of anthropogenic, I repeat the word, anthropogenic, uh, means basically caused by the human beings, if you don't know the word. Uh, challenges because of the climate change. In the slides, I was very minutely observing that we have to identify 300 megawatt, but out of that, almost more than 70% is still unidentified. We are 2022 now, 
in eight years' time when, because 70% of 300 will be 210, but when 216 megawatt is still unidentified, that's a huge, huge challenge. And I'll just add a bit here that the University of Bath, where I have the other leg or other foot, was the first British university to have a carbon management plan like our council, they also have adopted the climate action framework. Uh, not really in the council, we do not have that framework group, but they have also declared climate emergency. Now, there is Professor Pete Walker, who is a very famous professor working on these, and I don't I understand about the time, but have so there are basically two very, very simple questions. If we have not identified how to uh, mitigate 216 megawatt then in coming eight years, then we'll be able to ever, uh, really realistically achieve net zero carbon. Uh, and secondly, if you look at the University of Bath plant, there are so many things. So why do not, or if we have gone into any kind of collaboration with the Climate Action Framework, because at our door, the University of Bath, and they are doing fantastic work. That, not because I'm working there, and I don't have any role to, to in these things, but, but we could do that. So these two precise okay. questions. Thank you, YK. I, I think to a degree, the team in their presentation mentioned about the target numbers and, and the indicative nature, but, but do you, is there anything extra you want to add? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, we absolutely acknowledge the scale of the challenge, but I think I would just remind you that um, there's been a real acceleration. So, 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 you know, when we started to put this presentation together, the numbers were smaller, and, and last year they were much smaller. We've seen a real increase in the last couple of years in that, that wedge that, that, that we do know about. We're in discussions with, as I say, we, we, um, people in the, in, in the commercial and, and community sector who have identified um, considerable tens of watts, wattage of megawatts elsewhere, but we can't, we can't mention those yet. So, uh, as I say, I think that you, I think when we come back in six months or 12 months, you're going to see that wedge that isn't identified um, shrinking quite rapidly. Um, and on, the sec on your second point about the University of Bath, um, we work really closely with Professor Pete Walker and with Pete Phelps, who's the officer that leads the climate program at the University of Bath. We run a, a public sector climate group, which actually has been running for since about 2010, actually. Um, but there's, there's a real focus amongst all of us in the public sector. Uh, we meet regularly um, and we look at common um, issues, whether there's opportunities for um, putting bids together or whether there's opportunities for joint projects or just simply sharing um, expertise. So I think, I think we, are, we are working really well with them at the moment. Thank you. Uh, 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 let's catch up and then if, if we've got time, we'll do follow up. Uh, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to see the way the community energy company is coming on, because I remember uh, many years ago as leader, I was very instrumental in getting that uh, set up. But really, I think, uh, as uh, Councillor Kumar said, this, the scale of the challenge is uh, enormous. And I think uh, our job as Baines is actually to show that these things are, are not undeliverable. They just need imagination. And so to me, there's, there's several areas uh, that can be addressed. So first of all, it's not just our car parks. What about all the private car parks? Uh, and how are we working so that those car parks that are within communities, such as Canesham or Bath, particularly in Bath, where you've got all sorts of extra planning issues, uh, how can we get those gone? I, I mean, from my perspective, and I said this to Sarah many years ago, there's no difference to me between a, a car park that's got solar panels on it and a car park that's got concrete as the top level that's visible to anyone, but I'm sure there'd be a number of people in Bath that would disagree with that statement. But when you've got that, what are we doing, for instance, with other large landowners who've got acres of roof? And I'm thinking here particularly of the faith communities. You know, there's churches all over the place that have got huge roofs. Uh, and how do we... How do we, as a council, when we have to be careful about how we spend public money, and I work with BCE and the churches to enable them 
to get all that roof space prevent, providing energy so that they, they heat their churches for free, but also then feed back in uh, and make a profit to the grid. And I think going back to your problem that we've got, which is uh, the national grid, I think we just need to put more pressure on, on all our MPs to get that sorted. The, the answer you're getting from the national grid is simply not acceptable. Thank you, Paul. So I think private car parks and churches and other roofs. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think um, uh, we are very much focused on delivering the in-house, you know, on the council's estate first. So that, that, that's been our priority in the last few months. Um, Rob's only been with us since May. Um, so this is the first time we've had a dedicated renewable energy officer. So that's been our initial focus. But um, as I indicated in the next stage of the development we will be looking at that bigger picture at the 300 megawatts and what more we could do working with the community energy sector and the um, commercial sector and we will get we have been in touch with the with the, with the dioceses and, and and so on you're right they have got they have got capacity and they're and they're very interested in in doing it if and some of them are already doing it actually i think but you're right we need to look at where there are big roof spaces that 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 um that could be used. So we will we will be doing that as fast as we can. Is really all I can say at this at this point. Thank you. I think Shelley next. Oh, sorry, Sarah. Was just to say. Well, I think the suggestions that are coming forward, um, both from Councillor Kumar and uh, Councillor Crossley, are great, and we'll um, do more work to look into all of those suggestions. In terms of lobbying, um, yeah, we are just in the process actually of um, uh, putting together a letter to uh, the business. Uh, um, an energy minister um, in his new role to explain to him the, uh, uh, how the limitations on grid capacity impact us. I am concerned he might be getting a little distracted by fracking, which of course will take us in entirely the wrong direction. Uh, Shelley? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. Um, just a question, yes, about the uh, local energy and um, if it would give us more security, really, having a sort of local energy provision. And, um, I mean, could local people be um, encouraged to buy shares, possibly? Um, maybe so cheaply, so, so small numbers of shares, uh, to encourage local ownership and maybe more community buy-in. Would that be possible, do you think? Um, yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, that, that is the 40% the, the, the of our current installed capacity that is community owned, that's the model, what you've just described. So that is, that is how Bath and West Community Energy go about it, um, is they, they identify, they work with a community to identify a site, they work with the local landowner, um, and then and they do a lot of work on the ground, actually. It's, significant, it's sort of lots of invisible work that we can't see, but which they're, they're doing um, to work with that local community. And then the financing mechanism is through a community share offer, which they've been incredibly um, successful at in, in terms of, of raising exactly as you say and I think I can't remember off the top of my head Alistair might, might know this but what the minimum I think it is it is it is something which people can put quite small amounts of money in so it doesn't you don't have to be well off um, to be a shareholder in a local community energy um, uh, project uh, um, but I can find out for you if you want to know what the, what the smallest amount is. <laughs> yes thanks um, Bath and West Community Energy the uh, minimum investment is £100, and so it, it is quite attainable. And just anecdotally from Canesham Community Energy, which I know quite a lot about, um, which has a pipeline of projects, but as yet nothing there, we are being constantly asked by people when they can put money into it. It is a really popular community investment, and people get a very reasonable return on it. They get typically 4 or 5% or something, which these days, well, until a month or so ago, was actually a very reasonable return. Thank you. Uh, so I think then I've got Lisa next. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'm, I'm not quite sure because uh, we look forward to your updated chart uh, that you provided. Uh, but I note that uh, in terms of quite large chunks, you've got Marksbury, Chelmswood, Wilmington, and now uh, Nempit Shrubnall, all of which are in the countryside, uh, and I would echo uh, what uh, Councillor Crosley was saying about utilising more roof space within the city of Bath. And you, you've got a lot of warehouse space, you've got a lot of retail space, uh, you've got churches are a good example, community halls, which are not 
council owned, I do think it's very important not to, shall we say, take an easy, easy win um, and cover our countryside with solar panels. Now, I know that there's lots and lots of uh, issues around that, but I think it is important uh, because particularly if we're going to encourage people to buy into it, there are more people living in Bath than there are in the countryside. So I do think it's really important to press ahead with utilising roof space uh, in the city rather than just extending out into the countryside. We've kind of covered that point. Is there anything extra you're wanting to... No? OK. If I move on to Grant. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> we've uh, delivered four solar projects so far as a, as a council. Um, I just felt when I went through the report, it was just a little underwhelming, to be fair. Um, and I just wondered, really, what's taking so long to bring potential projects forward and get them installed? Um, it, it doesn't seem like we've actually been particularly ambitious in getting these projects you know, underway. The, you've identified a couple of schools, for example, um, but why, oh, I don't know why all four of them aren't on there. If we've got four maintained schools in, in Bath, North East Somerset, you know, surely it's obvious that that will be a potential pipeline, but they're, they're just not even on here. Um, so, yeah, I just wondered what the... Uh, why it's taking so long? Why? What's what's blocking? You know, getting stuff done, basically. I think it's um, taken some time, um, Grant, to get the right um, officers into the right posts and to to do the planning and to create the links with Western Power Distribution to get the policy framework in place. So that's what we've been busily working away at. Um, over the last three years and now we are at that place where the policies are coming into line and we have the staff in post and also you know it's about the technology coming down in price to a more affordable level uh, and so on so I think we're getting to a place where as um, the officers have, have laid out we should be able to move a lot um, faster I don't have the information about the specific schools in question but of course every individual project will depend on things like the orientation of the roof we can find out that information for you you know Yeah, uh, just to um, answer the question on the school. So we have uh, Newbridge and St. Cana is being planned at the moment. So the the, um, uh, the project is in development and the design of the buildings. Uh, that will go on there soon. Newbridge, we were about to put solar panels on, but we're waiting to hear if it's, it's getting a grant for uh, rebuilding or redeveloping the site. Um, and we await the outcome of that. I think it's the turn of the year that we expect to hear. So uh, we have to be careful not to put um, uh, good installations on an old roof that might have to be taken down soon. Uh, um, and so, yeah, the, quite often it's, it's just uh, a game of Tetris and getting the, the, the things in, in place at the, right, at the right time where the schools are concerned. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, and Pixash Lane is is quite an ambitious, you know, a large, you know, almost a megawatt. Um, it's the biggest rooftop uh, uh, installation in Baines when it when it's completed. So it will be a, a significant kind of growth um, there, and hopefully, sort of a template that uh, that you know a lot a lot of other buildings will follow. Thank you. I think, Lisa, you wanted to pick up your second point. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just a general question, really. We've been talking about solar panels. Um, there's water. We've got a big river running through veins. Uh, and, of course, there's wind. I mean, wind is a little bit more controversial because we are living in such a special area. And I'm not sure that there is much applicability uh, for wind without um, damaging our environment uh, aesthetically. But I should have thought with water... Um, there could be progress. Um, yes, you'd think so, wouldn't you, with the river running through? And, and it is a question that I think that we've had repeatedly. And um, at the last, the last time I looked into it, um, the experts in Bath and West Community Energy have done a lot of surveys of different places where local communities said, oh, couldn't we have a water, something to do with water power here or here? And, and so far, 
Um, and this may change in the future as technology develops, but so far most of the sites that have been looked at, um, there, isn't in, there isn't enough, will, will I get the technical term correct here, um, head. So it's not, there's just not enough power to justify the investment. You don't, don't get enough power out of it um, for it to be worthwhile. So that even the water wheel that Bath and West Community Energy put into Bathampton, when you talk to them, when they're honest about it, is they, they did it because the, the hotel at, at Bathampton really wanted to restore that water wheel, and it was, it was, it was a really quite important symbolic gesture for them. But the amount of power it actually produces is minuscule. Um, so they, they are not looking at that at the moment because it, it doesn't stack up. Um, in terms of, of the business case. Um, but we'll keep our eye open, and as we develop the, the, the next stage where we're looking broader um, at that, at, at what more that we could be doing, we will keep that under review. And as I say, I think you know, some of those sites that have been ruled out in the past um, may come back in as technology comes through that's more efficient, that's cheaper. I mean, that's what we've found with the solar. So we, when we did the survey of all the council's estate um, at sort of 18 months ago, it came up with a prioritised list of which roofs were suitable for solar um, based on the current state of, of those roofs. A few projects have come through since because works have been done on a... On a, on a the, the Clutton Depot is the, is the best example, which was ruled out in the original study as not being... that, that a business case wouldn't work. Now it does because the roof has been strengthened, uh, which was another, you know, a, a separate project. Now they can make a business case, so now we're going to put solar on that roof. So I think you, that will happen with water as well. Um, on wind, um, you're, 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 you're right. It's, it's a really important technology. It's cheaper, um, onshore wind. The government's talking about relaxing the planning rules around that at the moment. don't know whether that will come through or not. It will mean a change to the um, NPPF, the National Planning Policy um, Framework. Um, but in the work that um, planning policy team are doing, um, they've done a lot of work on... Um, um, landscape assessments for all types of renewable energy. So we'll be working with them on what that means for future policy in terms of which sites would be best across our district where there's the potential to, to put in, in wind. Because, yeah, you get a much bigger bang for your buck um, with, with wind energy. But you've got to, you've got, it's got to be, you know, the community's got to be happy with that. So there's a lot of work to be done through the community um, to make sure that, that that's, that's the case. No, it's 43 degrees, um, which it's not as hot as you might think. You need 60 degrees for a, for a wet radiator system, for example. Um, so it works, it works as underfloor heating like that. That's why they've put the, um, dropped the heat pump in the, the um, heat exchanger underneath the abbey. That's what they're using the, the drain to heat, which is a fantastic way to use it. Um, Rob Campbell's here. He's done the same in the Roman baths. So we're using... The, the heat from, from what we sit upon, if you like, in the city as much as we can. You've also got Phil here, actually, who can tell you about how difficult it is to access that water without upsetting the spa. Um, so it's not... Yes, it's there, and it is useful. We're in, in the right place, um, but it's not, it's not the whole answer. <laughs> All right, Sarah, were you wanting to jump in there? It was just a word on wind, really, to say that all um, people think of... I mean, so wind power, obviously, um, our uh, district is so sensitive in so many ways, it will always be very difficult to, to bring um, any significant amount of wind um, generation here. But I suppose nationally and more widely, people imagine it's unpopular and it's controversial. But in fact, the research shows that when people are asked... I think many more than you would imagine actually think of wind farms as quite elegant and, um, and you know, pleasant. Um, and I suppose I would just uh, point out that it is, in fact, our current government who have made the um, constraints on um, wind, onshore wind, so um, tight as they are in national planning policy. So if they were to reverse that, that would be very welcome. OK. Uh, Ruth, I think... Uh, yeah, thank you. Actually, what I was going to ask about, as you've already asked about, is to do with, uh, if, is there any way we can use the, uh, the spa waters to heat any further buildings? I mean, it's obviously not going to, to make a big impact, but for, for heating, like, would, it, would it be possible to uh, deed some of the excess water to the Guildhall, for example, to heat this building? But So it's at maximum capacity already, is it? Yeah. Might. My understanding from when the work was done on the Abbey, um, so we did talk to them about whether you could hook the Guildhall into that system, um, and it, it, it didn't work from an engineering point of view, because you can't actually 
I think piping the water is, is a big problem because it just furs up all your mechanisms, which is why dropping something in like a heat exchange system works better because it's easier to maintain um, and, and cost effective. So it was looked at and it was ruled out when the Abbey were doing their project. Okay. Uh, if I ask my one, I'll come back to you, Aslan, in a second. Uh, my question was actually going to be about financial models and whether there's an opportunity for the council to do partnership with financial services to be able to then do an arrangement with residents who want to invest about making kind of some kind of financial arrangement to make it easier uh, or whether we loan the, res the money to the residents and kind of then get that back over 10, 20 years on the payback. Uh, and have we explored that and have we kind of tried to see whether there are ways to kind of make uh, investment in home solar panels or whatever else uh, more accessible? Um, I have explored it in the past um, and we, we, we've been... We've had some conversations around um, where um, so, some, a handful of local authorities have done some uh, green bonds, muni municipal bonds, green bonds to raise, raise money for this sort of thing. Um, it's something that, as, as now that I've got some staff in place, we'll have, a, we'll have a look at over the next year and revisit what's happened in those places. How successful have they been? Do we want to have a look at that again? So yeah, we will look at it. Um, it's, it's definitely something that, that we, we should explore more. It's a good, good point. Uh, I'm conscious. YK, are you happy to ask your supplementary um, by email, or uh, is it burning? Right. Yeah, yeah, so you'll pick that up. And I guess I have a further question, which I'll maybe do by email, about uh, social housing providers uh, and how we're maximising the input from there. So if I move us then on that, I think that was a really helpful conversation, lots, lots of great ideas. But if I move us on, because I know we've got two super exciting, uh, and particularly our... our uh, uh, our, our visitors, uh, other agenda items. So if I move us on to Gull's strategy, I think we're having a presentation as well. And thank you to uh, those people who came for that item. That, uh, much appreciated. Uh, so are we, yeah, we're doing a Gull presentation. Yeah, perfect. As we're getting set up, am I right that the girl sits under Tim's portfolio? Yes. So if we want to scrutinise further the cabinet lead, we can direct our points to Tim as well, who's not able to join us today. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll we'll pick that up as a request. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I start by thanking both speakers? Um, both are involved with the working group that we have in relation to girls, are very supportive um, all the time, and sometimes keep my feet to the fire. So a lot of, a lot of the, um, of I think the, you know, the, the performance has been down to them. So there are three of us contributing to today. Phil Mansfield, um, Head of Building Control and Public Protection. I'm Alid Williams, I'm the Environmental Protection Manager. And Gordon Dugan is a shared officer that we've got with Worcester Regulatory Services. First of all, I've got some uh, statistics for you. So in Bath is obviously where we've got the biggest colony with, um, as it says there, 972 breeding pairs. Uh, this is a, an increase of 16% from the last time that we had the survey undertaken, which was 2018. There are smaller colonies, as you would expect, probably, um, in the vicinities. We've got Midsummer Norton, um, 183 breeding pairs there. And, um, and even though Kingsham has a smaller colony of 98, actually that's where we've seen the biggest increase. Um, girls are protected by law from Natural England, and Mr Kerr touched on that in his speech. Um, they were... They were held under the general license until 2019, but then Natural England changed their licensing regime. Um, and we were one of the pilot organizations with Worcester in 2019 in getting the organizational license. So this means that where um, we can demonstrate that non-lethal measures have been attempted and have failed or are unpracticable, 
that is necessary for the protection of public health or public safety, then we can remove the nest and egg or eggs of, um, of a girl. Um, in terms of members of the public getting in touch with us, we've got a web page that people can get, come through to us and um, explain to us how they are affected. And, uh, and this is important because 91 of those, um, so 91 of the total contacts. However, 22 of those contacts were from people who actually did not say or said positively that they weren't affected by girls and that they didn't want any action taken. So the common concerns we get, uh, th this won't be news to you probably, that it's sleep deprivation, the mess they cause on garden furniture, um, and the swooping. And the swooping, I think, there are two main causes of swooping on people. Um, one is where maybe a chick falls to the ground and the parents swoop to protect it. And then what we see in the city centre here particularly um, is where they um, grab your sandwich or your sausage roll. And we've probably all seen that. So um, what I would say in working with Gordon, actually, is some of the stories are fairly harrowing, actually. Mm. Um, and maybe we can come on to some of the detail there in your questions later in the discussion. There is a girl calendar. Um, they, they're good like that. They will conform to an annual um, life cycle, I suppose, um, between April and June. That's where they come back from the continent, um, or some of them come back. Um, they nest, and that's where the eggs hatch. Between then, June and August, that's probably the noisiest, messiest time where the um, juveniles fledge. And in September, and this is the state we're in now, September um, to the beginning of the next year then, we focus on proofing, because the, the whole, the whole, um, yeah, what, what underlines Natural England is that they are, they are protected in law and thou shalt not interfere unnecessarily with them. If you're going to do anything at all, then proof your roofs in order to dissuade them from, um, from nesting in the first place. Um, and that's the working group that I mentioned earlier. We've got councillors, members of the public and officers on this group. Um, and it's an opportunity for for me to um, to update what was happening and to get an idea and, and ideas and suggestions on future delivery. So I won't go through this in massive detail, but there are six tenants to the girl strategy. Uh, we need to know what we're dealing with, so confirming the evidence base. And I just mentioned that we had a girl count this year. Um, effective management of waste. So as Mr. Kerr said, the scraps of food on the floor isn't their main food source. These birds will fly. You know, 40 miles, 50 miles is nothing to these birds for a main meal. Um, they're strong. Preventing nesting, providing effective treatments. This is where we deliver the nest and egg removal service, where it's proportionate to do so. Um, and also we've had conversations with colleagues internally where we um, need to be leading from the front in terms of our own buildings. Um, and then engaging with stakeholders, I've got the, the proof the roof. Proof the roof. This is, this is about telling members of the public, if you're having any works done, you don't need a license um, to put in retrospective girl protective measures. So consider having that. You know, if you're bothered generally by girls, or if you've had girls nesting on your roofs previously, then, and you're having works done, then consider spikes, consider, I've got some photographs of what can be considered. Um, and um, Tim mentioned the Milsom Quarter campaign there. Um, this is where we will seek to, and um, we've engaged with the, that, uh, the team already, to, um, well, to ensure that it's less likely to be affected by girls in that particular vicinity. So um, planning's been mentioned already. Um, we are also, um, there is a planning advice document inexistent, it needs to be updated, and that's in our work programme for this year. And the ambition is for that to become a supplementary pro a policy document um, so that it's, it's got more teeth, to be honest, than an advice document, because, as with everything, getting it right first time, as opposed to retrospective, um, is better. Um, and we, we've had the... Um, 
discussion or the explanation earlier about natural England and the fact that these gulls may be not in production in numbers. So um, there's there's um, there's a, a link there to continuing to influence local government, um, central government, and particularly natural England. Uh, and that's working to an extent, I think, because with sleep deprivation, for example, sleep deprivation was not a reason initially when we had the pilot, but they've they've softened on that. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's certainly my feeling that three months of continual sleep deprivation is a health matter. Um, so then, more detail on the actions for this year then. This year we had a budget of 44,000. Um, led to a dedicated um, Gordon, working part-time. You've worked with 112 houses to date this year. The organisation licence that we had allowed us to remove 600 nests and 132 eggs. And again, this is important. We have done 48 nests and 72 eggs. That's because it's only in those cases have we been able to satisfy the licensing um, conditions. Um, every contact that we get comes across your desk. Mm -hmm. You interview them. You determine whether you think that Natural England um, would, would be satisfied, and then decisions are made. Um, but now, as I said, we're in the proofing part of the year. Um, Gordon's working with 22 properties to get them proofed. And, and I think the beauty of proofing a property as opposed to removing an egg is that property, whilst the roof is in that state, will always be proofed. So you don't have to go back year on year. Um, and I've mentioned the planning advice note and the gull exclusion zone. So I, I've just got some photos. You, you will have seen a lot of these. We've got spikes there for chimney cowls and ridges. Um, there's, there's two elements of the, gu the gull. Um, I think it's where they will land to, to view and just to see what's going on in the vicinity, and then separately where they will nest. So here you've got the, this is where they would land to take a look at what, what, what's going on there. Um, whereas here you've got amazing bath architecture, um, what you can see there is daddy long legs. Can you see that? It looks like a bit of a daddy long legs spider. This is basically weighted wires, which, um, when the wind takes it, just kind of flaps and dissuades them. You know, so we're taking a look as to whether they're effective. There's, there's always a conversation as to which gull um, deterrent methods are effective or not. We've seen kites and, and owls and everything, haven't we? And then, so these are examples from Worcester. Worcester are ahead of us in terms of proofing because you've been doing this for a year or two more, maybe? Well, yeah. Sorry, so you can probably hear me now. For, for two years, yeah. The two pictures, the, the left side of the picture, the central picture are from Worcester. The right-handed side is uh, from Bath or somewhere else, I, I, I guess. Bath, yeah. The key thing is that the key part of our strategy in Worcester, and it's also a quid pro quo with Natural England, if they license um, lethal control, we have to do our best to actually try to proof that site so the girls can't go in there again, so therefore further lethal control at that site isn't required. If we can't achieve that, then what we have to do is give a, is justify to Natural England why. And they will accept that, and for example, economic hardship or technical reasons can be a, a reason for not doing that. But we, we've actually had to just, and it's not rocket science by any means, but if you look at the left-hand side of the picture, um, that was in early 2020, and we've only been doing this for literally just over, over two years. But on the left-hand side of the picture, at the base of that chimney stack to the left there, where the chimney stack meets the upper sloping roof, there was a gull nest in there, and that gull nest had been there for a couple of years. So we removed that under license, proving to Natural England or make, presenting a case to Natural England that the people below were sleep deprived and that cr chronic sleep deprivation over the summer was actually causing problems for them, both mental and physical health. And they ultimately accepted that. And in those early days, after having a license when I first attempted to actually apply for them, refused, 
I actually um, appointed a clinical psychologist to go and interview somebody, and that clinical psychologist produced a 17-page report and itemized all of the problems, the mental and physical health problems this particular person had had as a result of the nesting goals. And, of course, that was very powerful evidence. A particular clinical psychologist was also a trauma consultant to the police, so she had a lot of, if you like, professional clout. Um, and that person also that we, was contained in the report, she previously had had no mental or physical health problems, so it was all attributable to the, to the girl. So they accepted that grudgingly. Um, but again, as part of that quid pro quo for allowing us a fair bit of flexibility in certain places, we had to put these proofings in. So I, we developed with our main contractor galvanized steel weld mesh cages, which we can literally put over the nesting niche, as it were, on the roof. And they're basically made to measure according to the particular circumstances. That steel mesh has um, a guarantee, well, the manufacturer guarantees a 25-year life. So at least this is something, if you, like, per, if you like, fairly permanent. And Worcester City Council, that I do this, this work for, basically subsidize the access and the labor costs for this. So we pay for the cherry picker and pay for the contractor to actually fit it. The householder pays a fairly nominal sum to actually get that in. That nominal sum varies. In that case, it would be 120 pounds. But if they, were appointing, if they were approaching a contractor to have it done without council assistance, the cost would be about £1,000 if you factored in either scaffolding to get up there or um, a MUP or cherry picker access. MUP is mobile elevating work platform. In the middle picture, that was a row of terraced houses where we had quite a few complaints from. And some of that proof, you may if you just look at the, the picture in the foreground, in the bottom left-hand side, you can see a mesh structure, and you can see a little bit of brickwork sticking out, out of the, the, the tiles there. And you can then see the um, chimney on the back. You look very carefully, and this is also a very useful point of, of uh, steel mesh cages, is that they're not visually terribly intrusive. So you've really got to be looking for them. And if they're put in behind a chimney, you can't see them at all. So, for example, the one in the left-hand side picture just isn't really visible from the ground. You really have to either be up at height or standing a long distance away. The gulls physically can't get in there at all. And, of course, the disadvantage of them is that if they can't nest there, their instinct is to return to the same nesting site and therefore, they'll try to nest somewhere nearby. And at the moment, we're following where they go and studying what gulls' reactions actually are. In some cases, they'll do their best to nest on the same building, and we may have to commit to reacting against that. So, for example, if you look at the left-hand side picture, you can see a, a grey plastic vent. They could potentially nest up against that on the upper side of it, and if they did, again, we'd react to that initially with nest and egg removal, and then we'd look at designing something in. Returning to the central photograph, we've got two A-frame mesh cages there, which is a design we developed. One of those was actually covering a nest site. The other one is preventative. So in other words, we're trying to, once we've actually paid a contractor, if you like, identify other potential nesting sites nearby and, in a precautionary way, proof those. Are we ready to move to uh, yeah. perfect? Okay, so uh, it's very interesting, and I'm, I know it's been an age-old problem for for our area. Uh, panel, is anyone? Paul. Yeah, I was very interested in your public private sector. I mean, how how does the council justify doing an individual household nine hundred pounds a report? Well, that, that, that's a very good qu question. So, um, I suppose what we'd be doing, uh, we wouldn't just be looking at one property. So the council, as Gordon said, we would, we would be looking maybe a number of properties that we would be addressing at the same time. So if we hire the cherry picker, um, then you know, that then is economical to do that, 
and then individual residents would be paying that additional amount uh, there. So we are, you know, working with residents. We are making the best of our best of our budget. I would say that way. So it's yeah. not an individual. I'm not saying bad stuff, though. Yeah. Just the point of the goal, a general one. But, okay, if you've got four houses in a row and one of them is a house of poverty and we hire a cherry pick out to go up there, it still means that the other three houses are getting a £250 subsidy each. But my question is, how do we justify that subsidy for an individual household? Well, it's... I suppose we have, we have a very limited budget. So what we have to do is look at where we can best we can best spend that budget. So look at the areas where we can make best use of that money. Um, now then we, we as you've seen there, Alid's figures. We had you know we've had a lot of requests. Gordon's uh, dealt with all those. So Gordon will look at it and see where we can make best use of that that limited resource. So we have to pick and choose, uh, and not everybody probably will be will get what they want, um, but it's, it's where we can make best use of the, those funds, I would say. So it's, it's a case of having to assess the, the requests that come through to us. Okay. Um, can, can I just add one for, yeah. further point to, to that? And that is, of course, places where there's, a demon, there's been a demonstrable threat to either public health or public safety. So we are reacting directly to that, and we do try to maximise the value from the contract as high a day to cover as many properties as, they re as we reasonably can. But it is directly responding to a proven, proved case of a, of a threat to public health or to safety. I, I, I get the sense we haven't totally solved that question, and it might be something we need to pick up with Richard and, uh, and, and the finance team as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, um, we don't normally go to the members of the public. Uh, 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 so, so if I go around the panel first, then we'll see whether we've got time, if that's okay. Uh, Grant. Um, it was you know, in interesting to see the measures that you're um, bringing forward to help uh, local residents. Um, but obviously, we've, if we're seeing significant increases still, how then do we manage that so when it's, it's on the decrease, not the increase? Um, I know it's obviously not easy, but this isn't necessarily, it will, it will help residents sleep at night, I, I agree, uh, but it doesn't help actually with the problem of the amount of, of goals that there are, and you know they're clearly finding other places to nest, hence why we're getting population increases. Um, so I just wondered, you know, how are we going to make that next step to actually see these numbers decreasing? Um, I think whilst we've got the organisational licence with Natural England as it is, our hands are tied, if I'm entirely honest, because, you know, proofing roofs is great, but, um, you know, cost per roof is high. Um, if there's a change to the licensing regime to allow in certain areas only and where concerns can be um, justified, more direct action, but that's something which the, you know, A, the local authority needs to consider whether he wants to go there um, because there's a section of society who disagrees with, with any interference of the words and they are protected by law. Um, so it would require a change in the, in the licensing regime. Okay, why, Kate? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> Couple of questions. I mean, girls, in my opinion, they are urban girls rather than sea girls. And although you say rightly that your hands are tied because of natural England, there are lethal ways to control and non-lethal ways to control. Now, the problem is that if the residents whose sleep is disturbed, even that is not acknowledged by the National England, that this is a real cause, and then very appropriate measures could be taken, because unless a doctor, as you rightly said, a psychologist or doctor, say it so. But 
in my opinion, these eggs are hot potatoes, and uh, there are really residents in particularly in Central Bath, but anywhere lately, because you know, the last count uh, was done in 2018. I think in May, you started doing that. I do not know the exact number, but in Bath, the breeding pair was in 2018, about 835, I, I just checked. And in Kensam, in Midsummer, Norton as well, you've got about 7,500. So my question is, how and what appropriate measures, and how can we build a pressure so that the, the, the real nuisance could be solved? And when will we know if I have missed anything? Because the counting was supposed to be started in May, and now it is September. So have we done the counting? And if so, what was the number? If I missed, then my apologies. But the count was done this May. Um, and maybe Gordon can share the numbers. You've got it in front of you, I think, haven't you? Yeah. Sure. So uh, Peter Rock counted 972 pairs within, within the uh, city. And that represented um, what he estimates to be an annual percentage increase of 4%. So they are rising again. The numbers. Uh, sir, yeah. So it's how, how do we calculate this? I mean, is there any other is there any other way that we add pressure yeah. on natural England? Well, I think that's that's it, isn't it? I think if there's a desire by local authorities, by society generally, to control these numbers, then they need to be taken off that list. Now, that's not where Natural England are at at the moment, and it would require legislative and licensing changes. Then, there are, the, you know, the, uh, employing um, a person to go up to remove a nest and an egg is significantly cheaper than employing somebody who's equally skilled, maybe, to, to construct something. You know, take, take uh, well, not dangling off, but being on a milk with a pole is very different from having to do intricate engineering, essentially. So you're going to get significant increased value for money on an S and egg removal. Um, but it will require legislative and, uh, and maybe, you know, coming back to um, the action plan, there's something there in the final column about lobbying central government and natural England. Uh, and I, I, I'd be happy to take your thoughts on that as a panel. YK is almost, it's not necessarily for the officers to answer, it's really a political question then about lobbying. And so we maybe need to redirect that at the cabinet uh, uh, member to kind of follow that through. Lisa, I saw you next. So, and b before I just bring you in, uh, both members of the public are, are signaling. We don't normally, do we? Uh, no, it's no. Panel it's normally just panel member questions and we're tight on time, so apologies. Uh, but you are welcome to come to the panel again and do another two pennies worth uh, uh, another time. Lisa. So it was the only, the only nesting place or, or something like that. 
Um, I, I'm certainly not aware of, of, of another type. The only other type of, of gull are hybrids between herring gulls and lesser blackbacks, and they've been spotted in fairly small numbers by Peter Rock, including this, this, this year. Um, and of course, both I mean, the herring gull has the very highest level of protection, and we're highly restricted about what we do. So on the organizational license, we have much more flexibility in terms of taking less of blackback gull nests and eggs than we do with her herring gulls. And that doesn't just reflect the different proportions, it also reflects the level of protection. I, I'm conscious on time, but I might try and sneak in my two questions and see whether, uh, but, but I'm conscious that fairly brief answers would be appreciated. Uh, one was, is there a role for community volunteers, and a bit like community litter picks, that we could increase the capacity of the team if we brought on some people who are motivated and, would, and got trained and all the rest of it, would that improve the efficiency? So that's question one. And question two is, is, is are there other ideas like rewilding and bringing in back hawks uh, to be flying in the rooftops of, of Bath? Is that actually going to help the problem or actually is, is there any evidence space to say that, that there's a wildlife solution to this rather than a human solution? We looked, if I take them, I'll take them number two first. Um, we, we looked at all sorts. Uh, you remember, probably, or maybe you won't, but years ago there was a public scrutiny day on girls where um, things like um, building, breeding platforms, places, and then, you know, dealing with the girls there. Um, so I think the answer to Matu is probably we're, we've we're deploying the best available as we speak currently. Uh, the first one was community champions, I think, probably. Um, they're, they're certainly emerging, aren't they, even in the communities that you're dealing with now in um, Westmoreland? Yes, that, that's absolutely right. I think we have such an individual, uh, or two individuals here, actually, w with us. Uh, that, uh, and, yeah, we certainly could, could you, you use volunteers. Um, but certainly... Members of the community, in, in terms of informing us of what the problems are, where they're located, and the, the nature of those problems, is really vital. Be helpful if. Um, oh, Ruth, I've missed you out. Sorry, I was just going to ask uh, for a bit more information about something. But going, going back to your point, so would we use uh, Fix My Street for that? Would that be helpful? <laughs> to to um, would it get would it get forwarded onto the? Uh, to the team, yeah. So that, that but, but my question was uh, referring to paragraph 312. I'm just wondering, you were saying here about how many eggs were removed and that 69 live chicks were relocated. And I was just wanted to ask you, where do they get relocated to? And is the idea that the parents then follow them and stay where they've been re relocated? I'm just interested. Thank you. Okay, the, the first point is that it was actually nine chicks. Yeah, so, yeah, not, not six, it's nine. And the only reason why we remove live chicks is where we're called in late, because often a gull nest can be present, for example. Even the household is sometimes not aware until the eggs have hatched and the chicks are on the roof. And then the um, adults start to get even more defensive, the chicks then, then make a noise. What we do is uh, we, we remove them, um, usually by using a cherry picker. Somebody has to actually go up onto the roof. They're caught in fishing landing nets, often on a pole, um, in a very humane, easy way, but they can only be caught if they're still in that downy stage and can't fly. As soon as the gulls have, the, the gull chicks can glide, it's very difficult to, to catch them. Um, so they're caught when they're really quite small, but it's only in exceptional circumstances. I'll explain one of the circumstances in just a moment. And what we do, and um, Naturaland are completely on board with this, and it was something that we developed in Worcester, they've transferred to Bath this year, is that they're, they're, they're caught and then they're taken straight away to a wildlife hospital and rehabil rehabilitation centre. And there, they're raised in out outdoor aviaries, but obviously closed in. And they're ringed by the British Trust for Ornithology so that they can be studied. Their movements, their survival rates can also be studied. Um, and then they're released on the Severn Estuary at the end of August. Uh, so the nine checks that were take, collected in Bath have been released on the, the Severn Estuary. And in due course, we'll see whether they survived and where they subsequently go. In terms of the circumstances that actually give rise to it, I'll just give you the most extreme one. I was called in 
in July to um, a property in Westmoreland Ward, where there's a lady who was in an advanced state of pregnancy. It was about seven months, I, I, I think, because on a flat dormer roof that she was directly sleeping below, there was a gull nest with, with three chicks. She also had young children in the house. And she, of course, given her, her pregnant state, couldn't sleep very, very well. It was also very warm weather at the same time, so windows were open. But she also had several young children, and of course she couldn't sleep because her young children couldn't sleep as well. And it was a dreadful, you know, real health hazard. Now, what really stunned me, if I just got... I think we uh, cut the details. Okay, I, I wasn't going to go any... Yeah, I was going if I wasn't it's going okay, to I don't want to move us on to the next agenda item, if that's okay. Let's, let's oh, yeah, okay, okay. I apologize. But all I'm saying is that health concerns can be really very real. Thank, thank you all, the team, so, so Gordon, Phil and Alid, for, for your input today. Uh, and, 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 and it's a live issue that won't go away. But I'm sure we'll be seeing you again very shortly. Uh, thank you all. Uh, okay, if I move us on to uh, item 10, the heritage services uh, strategy. Uh, and again, I think we're, we're having a presentation. Oh, and thank you to uh, the visitors also for coming along and your contribution. Um, I'm Robert Campbell, Head of Heritage Services. Um, I took over from Stephen Bird, who I'm sure you all knew um, in November last year. So I've been here since then. And I, I've been asked to cover today um, the strategy we've been working on as a service since I started, um, what's happening with the Fashion Museum, as far as we've got, and um, the uh, Discovery Cards as well. So we're going to run through all of that. And I've got about 26 slides. So and I've no, we're running short of time, so I'll try and go as quickly as possible. They were circulated beforehand, so I'll assume the details there. Fine. Okay, so um, I just outlined some of the drivers for a new strategy. So I inherited a service that could absolutely deliver at the Roman Baths, and we've proven that since we've reopened. Um, we're going pretty well at the moment. But I didn't inherit a service that was set up to do these other things because Stephen, my predecessor, wasn't asked to do all this other stuff. So COVID exposed the risks of the business model. You know, just having one major income stream is a bit of a risk. Fashion museums got to move. Um, climate emergency, net zero, we've got to move towards that. Governance and staff engagement practices needed to be looked at. Um, the service has no strategic approach to equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and there's also a desire from the council for the service to be more outward facing and have a, a wider regional impact. So we, we looked again, you know, what's the vision for the service going forwards? The one we had before was, was slightly out of date. And I worked with the team to come up with this and where we got to was learn from the past, understand the present, shape the future. And the reason we landed on that was, you know, Quite often people will see what we do as just a learning thing. You know, come here, learn some facts, go home. It's not really enough for us, to be honest. We want a visit to one of our sites to be really enjoyable, educational, but also help you understand the world around you. That's really important. But even that isn't enough. We want people to leave our doors and feel like they can go away and make a positive contribution. And that is where we're trying to get to. We've got three overarching priorities, which are there. Um, get back to profitability, move the Fashion Museum, and achieve net zero by 2030. Um, I won't go through all of these, but this sets out the mission for the future. You know, this guides what we're going to do. You know, sitting under the vision, these are the day-to-day -day things that my service deliver. And I think under these, we felt we, we captured all of the things that we do day in, day out. Um, <clears throat> really keen to show that the service is also part of the council. So we link the new strategy back to the corporate, uh, the service strategy back to the corporate strategy. And you can see the links here where we're tying it into the big priorities that the council has got. And then for the service itself, we've got some strategic priorities. 
Um, the things in bold are the headline, the kind of buckets that we're dropping everything into. And you see the bullet points underneath. That they're not the only things we're doing. I just put them there to give you a bit of a sense of what falls under those things. And this is how I've started in a systematic way to order the work of the service. And, and this is how you know, we have a very long list of all these things. So on and so on. But you can see kind of where we're trying to get to. So where are we trying to be? By the end of April this year, a new 2030 vision for the service, which is what I've just been through with you. By the end of 2022, a revised business plan reflecting this work, which will be coming through, uh, through, through Cabinet and Council. All staff with forward job plans on clear review that align it with the strategy. And then 2526, the Fashion Museum is in train. The Roman Bath is back to its pre-COVID financial performance um, and ideally exceeding it. And the Art Gallery and, sorry, the AG, Victoria Art Gallery, BRO, Bristol um, Bath Record Office have got a strong sense of evolution. They're not just standing still. And then just a bit of a summary of, let me see the whole thing, but, well, a bit of a summary of where we were in 21-22. It was a year um, muted by um, COVID restrictions and closures, but it's worth noting that we returned to profitability in 21-22. This year is much stronger performance, and there's a bit that the slides are cutting off. But in, um, in October of this year, we, um, October, in August of this year, we had 105,000 visitors through the Roman Baths. And that's the first time we've had 100,000 visitors through since 2019. So the, the market is coming back. What I would say is we're still about 30, 35% down on footfall from the pre COVID. So what that tells us is that um, our yield is going up. We're making a lot of money off the visitors that are coming through, which is great. Um, visitor satisfaction from our survey is also really good, but we're still not getting as many people coming through as we did before. So it, questions at the end, or shall I just keep going? Keep going. Fine. Okay. Okay. Fine. So what I'll do now is give you an overview of, uh, we've called it the Refashioning Bath Project in terms of the levelling up fund bid we've submitted, but it relates to the Fashion Museum, which uh, you'll be aware of. So just to get everyone centred, you know, it's worth noting that the Fashion Museum and the Fashion Collection is a national treasure. And everyone will say that about their museum collections, even if it's the Boot Museum or something. But the Fashion Museum really, really is... Um, one of the world's great collections. And that's evidenced by the, um, the number of loans out we do, for example. So every time there's a major fashion exhibition at the V&A, Met Museum in New York, over in Europe, undoubtedly we'll be lending to, the, to those exhibitions. We've got an incredible collection there. And at the moment, it, it is underplayed. Um, just to remind you of the situation, we've leased the assembly rooms from the National Trust for a very long time. The trust has exercised a break clause in that lease, so the museum will close on the 30th of October, and the council needs to, my service needs to be out of the building by um, the end of March 2023. Um, what, what we're keen to say, though, and, and what the levelling up fund bid made us think is not, oh, we've got a problem, we've got to move the museum. It's, well, if we're doing that, how can the museum be more than just move it from one place to another. And that's why we started to look at how culture can play a role in addressing some of the inequality that we find in, in, in the district. So we, look, we looked at the situation, and here are some of the things that we've picked out where there, where there is inequality in Baines. It's often between the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, as, as you'll know. So how can this project look to address that? Sorry, I'll go down. The high street also needs to change. You know, when you'll have been out there, if you go to New Bond Street now, if you go down Milsom Street, it's coming back to life a bit, but there's still vacant units there. The high street was changing pre-COVID and COVID accelerated that. We need to look at the high streets um, across the country uh, and in Bath and think it's not just a retail destination or a food and beverage destination. It needs to be something more. And we feel like this project can play a part in that. Um, there's also an opportunity. You know, globally, the fashion industry is responsible for a hell of a lot of emissions, a lot of pollution, um, and quite a lot of bad labor practices. 
how can we use a project about a new fashion museum to start to address those issues you know, and think wider than just people have a good time when they come through the doors. So what's our vision? We'll create a new fashion museum in Bath City Centre, and you can see some of the figures there, 25 million for that. And we'll create a new fashion collection archive down in Locksbrook associated with Bath Fire University, and there's a nine million pound investment there. The, these figures were established earlier this year, so they haven't been adjusted for the sort of rampant inflation that we've had over, over the last well, few weeks and, and few months. Um, when we look at the sums of money involved, um, the, the buildings and partnerships that we're getting involved with and the power of the collection, it, it's not hyper, hyper bold to say that this is one of the sig most significant cultural infrastructure projects in the country. And that's a really, really exciting proposition for this city, for the, um, for the local authority as a whole, and, and for the region. Um, you know, it, it's worth noting as well, when I talk to people about this, often they say, well, I'm not interested in fashion. And I think what we're trying to say is fashion is actually a universal topic. Everyone wear cl wears clothes. The collection we've got is not just posh clothes for rich people. It, it covers a full gamut of things. It is an engaging subject, and we know that people get excited about it. Just briefly, so what is the Fashion Collection Archive? Well, it's where we're going to store the collection. We have 100,000 items, more than that. It's huge. It won't all fit in the new museum. We need a purpose-built facility that will um, house it in, a, in an acceptable way, so in tight conservation standards, humidity, temperature. But we don't just want a black box where no one can go in. It's a civic asset. It needs to be used. So what we've been talking about is an association with Basketball University where the collection is integrated into their offer down at Locksbrook, where they're looking to create a new creative campus. It would support students, it would support graduates in a kind of incubator space, and it would also support the fashion industry in the Southwest by giving a creative and practical underpinning to all of those different cohorts. But it's important, it's, it's not just about us having a new place to store it and for the university to get some benefit. It needs to benefit local people more widely as well. And we'd see it as a venue that offers cultural and economic opportunities to local people through employment, volunteering, skills development, and creative programming. The museum itself will be located <coughs> in the old post office in Central Bath. So I've highlighted it up there. You can see it with the white roof with the pictures coming out of it. Um, you may have seen some of the press coverage that we had last week. We, um, we completed on the purchase very recently. So we, we've got a building and it's absolutely fantastic. It's a perfect home for it. But again, it's not just about having a museum there, it is, will act as a catalyst to the Milsom Quarter regeneration. It underpins the wider investment by the council and the private sector in that area. It gives an authentic sense of place and ultimately gives another reason for people to come to that part of the city. So when it's, when it's done, we're looking at 250,000 visitors a year and that is a mix of tourists, local people from, from Baines and also regional and domestic audiences. It's not just another tourist offer, it will be for all of those groups. It will allow us to look at the beauty craftsmanship of historic and contemporary fashion, but we don't just want a posh new museum. We don't just want a better version of what we've got in terms of the quality of the displays. It will be that, but it needs to, we need to use the fashion collection to help people understand themselves better, the world around them, and talking about the vision and the strategy, leave that building, leave that engagement with us with the tools to help them change, change their own lives and change the world around them. So we'll talk about issues around sustainability, identity, social justice, things like that. Um, we're not just talking about strict cultural projects like a store or a new museum. Both these facilities will be hubs for inclusive cultural engagement uh, and levelling up. So working on the levelling up bid we've put in, we had a strong skills component in there where we can use the collection we've got and the spaces we'll have as hubs for apprenticeships, placement, volunteers, free entry for local people. So we know that we think it will spur cultural engagement in areas who, uh, and amongst uh, community groups who don't necessarily engage with what we do at the moment. Um, and it's a really, really exciting proposition. So what's the current status? 
We need to get out of the assembly rooms. We've moved the majority of the collection down to Dents, who are glove makers in Warminster that some people might be familiar with. So we have a commercial arrangement with them. We're storing the collection there. All of it has gone, apart from what is on display. So we're on track to get out of that building. And we're drawing up engagement plans around digital loans and community work. So when it is, it's not just going dark. It will be as accessible as it can be down there. We've already got half a million pounds from the council, um, from the capital um, of capital money to undertake feasibility and design in this financial year for the fashion collection archive down in Locksbrook, and that work is ongoing. Ongoing. We've had an eight million repayable grant from Wecker um, for the building, so that's how initially we're cash flowing the purchase of, of the old post office, and we recently received six hundred thousand pounds from Wecker as part of the Milson Quarter outline business case, which was overall was a two point four seven million um, grant from them, and. Uh, I wrote this presentation before we had the decision. We're also setting up an independent charity, which was approved as part of our business planning uh, last year to facilitate the, uh, the, the, the wider work on the project in the same way that we have the Roman Bath Foundation uh, to support what we do at the Roman Bath. And we submitted a levelling up fund bid um, on August the 2nd. So we're anticipating, there's no set date for the outcome of that. We asked for £20 million and we'll be looking to find out whether we've got uh, the decision on that at the back end of November. They haven't committed to a day, I think, at this stage. Um, having gone through that, I'll now move on to the discovery cards um, very briefly. Um, as some of you will know, we put the scheme into abeyance uh, over COVID because we weren't having visitors. We are now starting to issue new discovery cards. So the project goals are there. I mean, essentially make the whole scheme up to date, more inclusive and, and more effective for us. Um, I won't go through all of this, but it shows you, the, if anyone hasn't got their discovery card yet, it shows you the process of how you go about it. We've made it as simple as possible. And the key thing is you can get a physical card, which is uh, recyclable, or you can get a digital card there. Um, here's where we are. Um, there's some headline numbers there. Um, from where we were in August, we've now issued just over 12,000 cards, so we're on track to hit the numbers that I put in this presentation. We're getting on with issuing them. And there is a physical process with that. We can't just do it online. People have to come and validate their identity either at one of our venues or at the, uh, one of the one-stop shops. Um, and just to remind everyone that um, it's not just about free access to the council's venues. There is a growing, this, this list is probably out of date now. There is a growing list of partners we've got in place. Um, where we offer discounts. Um, some key benefits there, which you've seen, and then some medium-term challenges. We, we know that we're not reaching all of the communities in Baines, and we're not necessarily reaching the, the people who would benefit from free access to the, to the cultural assets that the council owns. That is a key task for us moving forward. So, and it's not something we'll solve immediately. We'll try, you know, our goal is to have every single resident in Baines with a discovery card and feeling engaged with the cultural assets and using them. Uh, and that's where, that's where we're aiming to get to. Um, and that's kind of where we're saying create a supporter community. It's not just transactional, have a card go away. It's saying you're part of one of the most amazing clubs in the country. H how can we help you do that? And that is it. Brilliant, thank you, Robert. And apologies that we're a bit tight on time. That's fine. If we do, one question needs to start off with and see how we do. Lisa, you caught my eye first. Yeah. Yeah, they, they've taken it in for uh, business reasons for them, really. They have, they have one of the highest membership bases in the country in, in this area, and there are not lots and lots of properties uh, to validate that membership offer. So they see an opportunity there to take over the assembly rooms and turn it into a more, I don't know how to describe it, a more national trust type immersive experience. So recreate what it was like in the Georgian times that will bolster the value of their membership offer for the people who have memberships here. And Bath's a tourist town, so they see an opportunity for visitors to, to come, come, and, come and explore that place. Well, 
Well, I think they, when they look at the, uh, the venue, they look at using the, it in its totality. They look at using the whole thing, basement included. Yeah, we pay we pay some uh, lease charges to 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 look off uh, to inhabit that building. Yeah. Not off the top of my head, no. Yeah, if you could let me know that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, uh, I maybe I have <coughs> not got uh, I couldn't hear you properly, but obviously it will take time, maybe from three or four years to eight year maximum to sift everything. Uh, so where will be these uh, pieces of invaluable uh, <coughs> cost will be put, really? Where will be they located during so that intervening period? And the new site will, will be accessible for the disabled people as well. Um, yeah, I, I said in the presentation, I probably glossed over it too much, we've got a relationship with Dents, who are a heritage glove maker based down in Warminster. And we are leasing a floor of their HQ warehouse down there. Um, so the collection has been moved down to Dents and is, is stored there at the moment. And wow. pardon? in Warminster, wow. yeah. So they offered us a, a really excellent commercial rate, so much cheaper than we were getting when we looked at the properties available around here, um, and much better quality as well because it is a, a fashion business. They have excellent pest control, security, fire prevention, all those kind of things. So it was a really good relationship. Um, the, our approach, as we've evidenced at the Roman Bass, is we try and exceed, um, exceed um, code standards for disability access. So inclusive, inclusivity will be central to this new project. And we will go as far as we can and we'll always try and exceed the basic standards for, for disabled access. And we've sort of set, I think we've shown, we've, we've demonstrated that at the Roma Bars. So we'll go as far as we can and make sure we commit to that 100%. Um, yeah, I just well, I, well, I want to say what a great report it was actually. And I thought there was a lot of good stuff to see, see the council um, doing. Um, what I wanted to know though is, uh, how much does this strategy sort of feed into the content of exhibitions that are shown? As, um, I mean, partic more particularly like the uh, Victoria Art Gallery. Because um, from my perspective, I go to a lot of art shows and a lot of art exhibitions. It's a passion of mine. And, but I don't find myself going to Victorian Art Gallery very often because they don't tend to show particularly significant contemporary artists um, like somewhere like uh, the Arnolfini in, in Bristol or Hauser and Worth down in Bruton. And I just wonder how this strategy can actually help um, deliver uh, more, uh, better <laughs> quality exhibitions at, at those sites and whether it, it will be doing that. Sure. I mean, I think uh, the quality of the exhibition is always subjective. <laughs> and I, I, I think we do some really absolutely fantastic things there. I, th I think what you're saying, you, your question is more about um, audience development and actually the, pe the appeal of different, um, different activities to different audiences. And I, I think you're right. We, we don't have a track record of delivering um, whatever, more cutting edge contemporary art shows at the Victoria Art Gallery. Um, the curator there, John Bennington, has been a council officer for 26 years. He's retiring at the end of October, and we've recently recruited for a new senior curator there um, who, who, who currently um, works in Bristol. So we'll be looking at our strategy for, for that site and allowing her to stamp her mark on it. But underpinning it will be another look at who, who's it for, and, and in a more nuanced way than just locals, tourists, but actually starting to think what are the type of um, ages, families, economic circumstances, uh, and also the, the type of shows we put on. So I think going forward, hopefully there'll be more things there that will be more engaging to a wider range of people, but we will underpin it based on this strategy. So the outcomes are people understand themselves better, think about what they can do when they leave the, the doors we go through. That whatever goes on show, that's what will underpin it.
Okay, thank you. No, it's a very good report. I, I wanted to ask you about the strategic priorities a little bit, so going back to the beginning. Um, uh, to bring benefit to both the South West and the UK, um, so I, I know a lot of people have um, talked about the fact that we haven't had a visitor information centre in Bath for a while. And I would say now that we do, in a sense, because Bath Bid has um, got their office in York Street, which is conveniently just up the road from um, the new World Heritage Centre. So, so in a sense, they are filling that gap. But at some point in the future, it would be nice if we, I know it comes back to resources and funding, but um, have you um, had any conversations at any point with uh, First Bus about developing the previous travel centre in the bus station? Because that is near the railway station and, and that's a good place where people, you know, come off the trains, the buses, sort of catch them before they come into the centre. So that, that was... Um, but and, and connected with that, the, um, I wanted to ask you if you could say a bit more about long-term... Yeah, sustainable tourism partnership um, and encouraging more sort of slow tourism, as it were, encouraging people to stay here for longer and also to not necessarily come here in their cars. Um, sorry, sorry, yeah. 